<coughs> and I apologize, since I'm pretending to be an interviewer tonight, I decided we were going to sit. So I know it's harder to see, jump up, look around, watch the recording when we post it. We'll get everything out so you can see that. Um, I told Ken I was going to ask him some softball questions to start. So we're going to start with a little less than history stuff. But we're always curious about this. There are professions that seem to really like the history of their profession. And lawyers are one of those professions. We find a lot of lawyers who are interested in, of course, law is built on case law and history and there's precedent, yeah, so that history. makes sense, yeah. Um, but Ken, are you, you're a member of the Supreme Court Historical Society, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, which is one of the first groups I met. I got a call years ago from a guy researching lawyers at the Alamo and started realizing you know, Dylan this, Drummond. this was a thing. It yeah. was Dylan Drummond, yeah. that's right. And I wasn't gonna tell the story, but since you mentioned him by name, Dylan called me, I think, on a Thursday and said, I'm going to drive down there from Austin tomorrow so you can show me the recruitment office where Travis was recruiting cavalrymen. And I told him, if you can show me where that office is, I'm going to put you on the staff. <laughs> so we had a little chat about what was here and what wasn't, and uh, it was a lot of fun. So thinking about lawyers, why are lawyers such a big part of the story of early Texas and certainly of San Francisco well, Austin? What happens? Unfortunately, there were a lot of lawyers. Uh, there are actually some pretty good lawyer stories from, from back in the day. Uh, uh, you know, William Travis was a lawyer, as was his bestie, Patrick Jack. And they, of course, were the ones that stirred up all the trouble in Anahuac. Um, and, and lawyers are re uh, real good at starting stuff and sort of fading back and watching what happens. So is that right, David? <laughs> yeah, not that you ever did that. But, uh, so anyway, they, they were good at that, although although Travis took one for the team and went to jail. But um, uh, so they were there from the beginning. And then, of course, you have the site of Travis's law office here, which right. you know the location of. I'm highly impressed by that. Uh, he practiced law right where we're sitting. Um, and not sure how powerful a lawyer he was, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of them. But it, are, in fact, well, um, there's a funny story, and this is totally not San Felipe related, but I was talking to somebody about the German immigration earlier, which my family was part of, and there was a community, there was a bunch of communists from Germany that were going to come set up a community called Bettina north of uh, Fredericksburg, and so they set it up, and then it fell apart, which, you know, all communist societies are going to fall apart, but the records show that Two things. One, the arguments were about who was working harder than whom. And two, there were a lot of lawyers there. So, <laughs> and we're allergic to the physical labor. So, um, so, But there were just a ton of lawyers attracted. I think any place where you've got, of course, you have a lot of land. It was all about the land. You're going to have lawyers. You're going to need them, believe it or not. And then any time you're creating a, a country or a state or a society or something, that's all the legal structure and we wanted to do it like America did it and so you needed lawyers. Good stuff. <clears throat> so I was thinking about this, obviously our site has a direct connection with Stephen F. Austin and so I told Ken I might ask, and I am, if Stephen F. Austin hadn't taken father's lead and jumped into Texas on his grand adventure, he was apprenticing as an attorney in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. If he had never come to Texas or hadn't become an impresario in Texas but became a lawyer in New Orleans, would we know who Stephen F. Austin was? Would there be any history to him? I doubt it. Okay, that's that's my he, take as well. You know, he didn't. He just not that he wasn't tremendous. He was. He killed himself for Texas, basically. Sure. And um, but yeah, no, he wouldn't. Although you know, he was a justice of the peace in Missouri, I guess, before his right. time in New Orleans. Um, and we certainly focus on in his role as impresario. He's, he's a quasi-dictator. He's overseeing every aspect of his calling in the first few years, including whatever the judicial system looks like. Um, but anyway, I, I had the same thought that obviously Texas created the man in this case and the man mm -hmm. contributed to the, the legend and the myth, but if he were just a lawyer in New Orleans, I'm thinking we wouldn't have a capital city name for him. So. No, I don't think so. One name. of the interesting parts of that, of the San Felipe time, was one of the things that he really wanted in Mexico to let him do was make, our, make his own law. You know, makes it, keep it local, right. essentially. And so they, they allowed him to write a code, uh, which you can find in Wooten's two-volume set, I think, the, the Laws of San Felipe. And that was the first set of laws that we had. And that was really important. To your point about <clears throat> people coming to a place where a society is being formed, 
you know, Austin wasn't even actually a lawyer when he got here. Mm -hmm. And yet when he goes down and spends a year <coughs> in Mexico City and comes back to start the colony, he's bragging on the fact that they asked him for his thoughts on the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Here's some notes I gave him. This, yeah. I thought this would be good if they're thinking about how to build a government. So yeah. it's yeah. certainly part of that. I've got some water behind you if you need okay. it. Okay. So. Yeah, I'm just hacking um, my way through. <laughs> Um, it's all this fresh cut grass you got. Over yeah, there. You mentioned Travis, who some people don't know that background. Are there any other early Texans that you think people are surprised to learn were lawyers? Anybody that oh gosh, stands out? Surprised to learn they were lawyers. Gosh, they were all Lusk, that and a lawyer too. Yeah. Lusk was a lawyer. John right. Hemphill, of course, was a lawyer. Sure. And then there's my favorite lawyer, Benjamin Cromwell Franklin, okay. who was a, a lawyer from Georgia, very successful, practiced law with his brother in law, who went on to be governor. And he came to Texas in 1835, as did so many others, just uh, to fight. I mean, he didn't need to be here. He was on his way to prosperity. Right. And uh, he became a messenger in the Army. And then he was the guy that um, he delivered some cargo from a captured Mexican ship to San Jacinto on April 20th. And on April 21st was ordered to go back to Galveston to <coughs> tell David Burnett at all that the battle had been won. And so he went, if you can picture having lunch at the Monument Inn and getting in a rowboat and going to Galveston. So it took him four days to get to Galveston. Uh, which, you know, where's Peggy? There's Peggy. It'd take you four days to get back in a car now. But, um, it's, uh, it's two and a half hours. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, but he rowed to Galveston and told him the battle had been won. And uh, the problem with that was the captured ship that they had all that cargo from it's called the Pocket, and it was an American ship that had been chartered by Mexican agents. And so we had gone to war with the United States before the Battle of San Jacinto, which I always tell people, I'm not advocating going to war with the United States. I'm only saying it's been done. So, <laughs> um, so uh, we had an international crisis immediately upon the successful conclusion of San Jacinto. And so David Burnett wrote an executive order that I found uh, May 8, 1836, creating a court so that they could try the case of the pocket, which they did, and he appointed Franklin the judge. So he was the very first judge in the Republic of Texas, too. Mm -hmm. But that was the biggest problem of the day that they had to solve right then was the capture of that ship. And so the very first issue for the Republic was a legal issue. So <laughs> one of my favorites that I know you're aware of, many of you may not be, and unless you're from Chambers County, it probably doesn't resonate with you much, but Thomas Jefferson Chambers, who spends a lot oh of time gosh, here yes. and has a huge footprint in the legal history of Texas. So many of you may not know a lot about Chambers in general or that he was a lawyer, but very, very invested. And one of my favorite <clears throat> stories, as he has an origin story and kind of a conclusion story that I find are pretty cool on both ends. The origin story is he decides his entrepreneurial effort in Mexico is gonna to be to go to Mexico City and teach people there what's about to happen. Here's all these crazy people coming to Texas. Let me tell you how this is gonna work. So he becomes part, he, he, he passes the bar, I think maybe the first attorney, that, American attorney that passes the bar. First Anglo attorney licensed yeah. in Mexico. Yeah. And then uh, becomes ultimately the surveyor for the state of Coahuila y Tejas and is very actively involved. And here during the war government, at the end of this story, he's working in various ways, but also has a moment where he's called out as a Tory because he'd been so close to the Mexican mm -hmm. government. So next time you go to the Capitol in Austin, all this to say, if you enter on the south side, I think it's on the south side, there are two howitzer cannons south that side. flank the doors as you come in. And if you look closely at them, they're engraved as a gift from General Thomas Jefferson Chambers to the Republic of Texas. So when they challenged his loyalty to the independence cause, he said, I'll show you. I'm gonna go get some men, I'm gonna get some guns, and I'm gonna come back and, and be a player in this. His guns didn't make it before independence was won, so yep. Jacinto happened quicker. But I remember the, the historian who told me this story was Jim Woodrick, you know Jim, uh -huh, I'm sure. Uh -huh. And uh, I told Jim I was gonna go see the howitzers. <clears throat> and I, had, I hadn't really done any research, and I saw them, and I called Jim up and said, when did they engrave them? That's kind of cool that they commemorated them. He goes, they were ordered that way. They came with this day <laughs> month. I said, oh, okay. Well, we didn't have to commemorate it. it was Can like, I add something to Fire Chambers? Work. He's yeah. a fascinating character. So he went, he was from Kentucky, and he uh, studied law. Back then, you didn't pass a bar exam. You just studied under somebody, and they certified you. And it's called reading the law. And so he did that in Kentucky for a couple of judges. And then he went to Alabama and, and got into the Alabama bar under the... Uh, I think he might have been the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court at the time, named Abner Lipscomb. 
And so then he comes to Texas and we have all this and he gets himself appointed the surveyor, as you said, for Mexico. Well, think about what that meant. If you had a land grant, all you had was a piece of paper. You had to go locate the land, which is a legal term, and the surveyor is the one that locates the land. And so uh, what Chambers did, instead of getting paid in money, he got paid in land. Right. And so he had 100 plus thousand acres in grants, and guess who locates it? He does. <laughs> and so he located all this stuff, and a lot of it people were already living on. Some legally, some not so much, uh, including where, you know, the town of Anahuac and that whole area, which he renamed Chamber C. Not that he had an ego. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so he was a very controversial figure. And then he located some of it near Waco and then some of it in Austin. And uh, one of the areas that he located was the hill on which the Capitol was built. Right. And so the longest running piece of real estate litigation in Texas history is the chamber's heirs litigating with the state over the title <laughs> to where the Capitol building sits. Well, that's a pretty important case. And the legislature settled it in the early 20s or somewhere for $25,000. So we don't know what the Capitol building is worth, but we the only evidence we have is it's worth $25,000. <laughs> so he was controversial. Some days enough. it's not worth even that. I can assure you. He was controversial enough that <clears throat> chambers was actually assassinated. Yeah, he was assassinated in his home. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's which is still there, uh, and there's some controversy over there. They're moving it for construction of a new jail or mm, something. But, I haven't heard that. But um, yeah, the portrait, the bullet, he was holding an infant, the bullet killed him, did not harm the infant, and went across the room. You can go in the room and lodged in a portrait of himself, which hung in that room. <laughs> so and that house, I'm sorry, I could go on forever. That house is one person, the doorways are one person wide, so two people can't come through at once. He needed some precaution, apparently. <laughs> and I think that portrait still exists, and the shotgun, that, or the gun that was allegedly used to kill him is in the Chambers County Museum in Wallaceville, but nobody knows if it's really. The other thing, you know, <laughs> after that, let me think, what was the case? So there was a case in the Supreme Court, and back then what happened was the file the record went to the Supreme Court. You went to the court, walked to the court in Austin, checked out the record, took it home, wrote your brief, brought the record back. So there was litigation with the Wilcoxes and somebody else over some land. Wilcox was one of the Wilcoxes who allegedly shot Chambers. And um, <clears throat> so he took the records out purportedly to write a brief and never brought them back, which is a good way to keep from losing your case. <laughs> and. Uh, and there was some testimony that there was a lawsuit in Houston uh, where the record had been offered into evidence by Chambers, a separate one. And the witness to that event was Benjamin Cromwell Franklin. <laughs> so uh, Texas history is a small world. Well, to bring it back to San Felipe, those of you that know our story, of Celia, <laughs> no, no, no. those of you that know our story of Celia Allen and some of the stories we tell mm -hmm. about her legal journey, William Travis is involved in that as a lawyer, as is Thomas Jefferson Chambers. So he's one of the attorneys that drafts her manumission document, which really was not a legal requirement at the time, but her owner who was going through this act uh, did a very elaborate, almost theatrical uh, mm -hmm. effort to, mm -hmm. to free her and her children. And Chambers was part of that story. So I've got two more softballs and then we're gonna get real. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted you to share if, <clears throat> if it's appropriate, any Texas history books you're recommending or, or telling people they need to read these days? Mm. Um. I am reading uh, Rick McCaslin's biography of William Wright, mm -hmm. who was a ranger who served um, during a time, he's the only, I think he's the only ranger to have served in the Frontier Battalion and the DPS. I'm not for sure, don't hold me to that. I'm not to that part yet. But, um, you know, he rode a horse and he drove a car. So it was an interesting time. Uh, it's the Bicentennial of Texas Rangers, That's so right. I'm doing a lot of Texas Rangers stuff. and. Uh, and they deserve it, and they're the greatest law enforcement organization I've ever seen. I get to work with them occasionally, and uh, got nothing bad to say. Um, but that's, I have become a book collector, which some people define as a hoarder. Um, but, uh, so I don't know, there's so many books I gotta read unread. You were talking about Harrigan. I was kind of his designated interviewer for like three or four different things around the state. He would call me, I gotta go to Rockport, will you come interview me? And I love his book. Yeah, that's a good book. Uh, big, wonderful thing. And uh, um, Lorenzo de Zavala is, is coming up. I'm going to read that. Um, 
you know, De Zavala came through the United States a year before de Tocqueville, and like de Tocqueville wrote what he observed, but nobody knows about that one. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, especially given his connection to Texas. But um, yeah, Well, you've good. pointed out I'm going to step on some of our time. I was remiss in setting up our program tonight and not telling you all we're working on a temporary gallery installation that I think most of you will be interested in that will be up for the next year starting in September. And to Ken's point, it's going to touch on a lot of these bicentennials. <coughs> we're privileged as stewards at this site to be connected to some really early stories. So we get to get out there ahead of a lot of folks with those anniversaries. So the founding of this town was in the fall of 1823. And this exhibit will explore that uh, early mapping, early surveying. We're working with agency partners like the General Land Office and the Briscoe Center to loan us some really unique objects. But to that point, <coughs> The militia companies that are the ranging companies that ultimately migrate into what we think of as the rangers today were mostly involved in the surveying effort. They're, they're protecting surveyors. The surveyors themselves had to protect themselves on the frontier. So that'll be part of the story. And being up for a year, it'll open with the bicentennial of the founding of the town. It'll close with the bicentennial of the land grants issued to the old 300 here on the wall. Oh, so that's, that's the summer of 1824. So those <clears> two <throat> things line up very well. So look forward to coming and seeing us when that's up and going. It's going to be fun. All right. So obviously, I didn't, I don't know if I mentioned this, I didn't do a bio for Ken. I think y'all all know some of his exciting background. <laughs> but he's a very popular history podcaster, of course. Any other podcasts that you like or that you recommend? No. Oh, yeah, right. I know. Right? <laughs> I thought about that one. You know, it's so liberating that I do the podcast for fun. So I want everyone to listen to all the podcasts. There have been a lot that have started since I started Wise About Texas, and most of them have gone away because it's hard. But um, there's one called the, well, the, the Crown Jewel is Hardcore History by yeah. Dan Carlin, and he helped me a lot with mine, and he's just a wonderful podcaster. And, and you'll look, his episodes are four to six hours long and and he does them without a script and he, he just reads and reads for months and then records his podcast and the topics are somewhat obscure but the way and, and the first time i looked at it i'm like there's no way i'm not listening to this but he's just so good at it that um that's a good one uh there's a guy in michael sparkman up in north texas a farmer who started something called texas history lessons because he just wanted to learn Texas history and it kind of motivated him and he's such a nice guy um, so the, I like that I mean but it's just kind of his stream of consciousness whatever Michael is thinking about gets put into a podcast um, which is fine but we've had one other I think person uh -huh. who would be identified as a podcaster ever do something for this series and his name is Brandon Seal oh uh, Brandon gosh yeah Brandon and I are good friends he's yeah. uh we're in the Texas Lyceum together. He's an oil and gas guy, married to a Mexican national, Mexican woman, very fluent in Spanish, works in Mexico a lot of the time. Very good researcher, very diligent, very, oh, I'm sorry, very focused. And uh, he has done some tremendous work and he's got a new one out that I hadn't listened to yet. But um, he is the first guy, Brandon is, to really narrow it down for the Battle of Medina, right. the site of the Battle of Medina. and. Uh, and he told me some stuff that he didn't put in the podcast. That, uh, but it's very interesting. And he, he did one on Cabeza de Vaca, I think. Right. He did one on the Republic of the Rio Grande. He did, <coughs> he did the, uh, the Battle of Medina for us. That's the topic we mm -hmm. had him talk about. If any of you, that was a virtual program during the pandemic. And uh, we were interested in it, of course, because some of Austin's colonists are on that battlefield. Santa Ana's on that battlefield. A lot of these players, and, and it's just this mysterious sort of lost bit of Texas history. So yeah. he was really exciting to have on. And the one that I've been listening to, I'm glad you brought it up, when I'm riding the mower or whatever the house, I've been listening to the Cabeza de Vaca, which is really mm. compelling. It's just a yeah. really good podcast. So, all right. We got his through his all podcast the is called A New History of Old Texas. Right. And he does seasons. Yeah. And to your point, he's done a ton of work with... Uh, the Whitliff Connect Collection at uh, Texas mm -hmm. State, mm -hmm. and a lot with the, the, the uh, research archives in San Antonio. All right, we kind of talked about the question of why lawyers were here. So I'm going to skip that one. You can forget about that. But we wanted to talk, I think I brought my Smithwick book with me. Get up for a second so I can show it off. Most of you are aware of this book, <clears throat> which is one of the early memoirs connected to our story, connected to a number of stories. Ken and I always find something interesting to talk about <laughs> in Smithwick. And he was not a lawyer, interestingly enough. He's a blacksmith and a memoirist, which is why we can talk about him. 
Um, but he seemed to find his way into goofy legal yeah. stuff yeah. with some regularity. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about some of our Adam <coughs> Smith things. And I was asking Ken not long ago, I had a visitor come in on a Sunday, and I often work the front desk on Sundays if y'all come see us on the weekend. And she came in and was acting kind of shy and act like she wanted to talk but didn't want to bother me sort of thing, which usually means uh, genealogical researcher, which yeah. she was. She was trying to figure out some family <laughs> story stuff. And she lives in Western Canada, but grew up in Ohio. And just as fate would have it, she and her husband had been on a trip together and decided to come home separately. And she decided to come explore her family story. And she asked me finally, if I'd ever heard of a guy named Isaac B. Desha. And I really did not remember or know this story. And when she referenced Smithwick, I realized one of the reasons is because he shows up in a story here under an alias. So even the name- you know, would John Parker. Was yeah, John alias. Parker. And so in this instance, <laughs> That's not even who she's interested in. Her family connection is to the guy that Parker Desha is presumed to have murdered in San Antonio. <clears throat> and so her family member had come down from Ohio, from her origins in the, in the 1820s, seemingly to cash in. He's gonna flip some mules, right? So it's before house flipping. He's gonna come down and buy a Mule bunch of flipping. mules and flip the mules, yeah. And uh, he ends up dead. The and used car business yeah. of the 19th century. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> so in Smithwick's case, he runs into Parker somewhere, takes a horse off of him, brings the horse back here, and runs into one of the local businessmen who says, I sold that horse to a guy <laughs> not yeah. long ago. And that's the dead guy. The dead guy's <laughs> that's horse. The guy that she's looking for. So it's interesting. A lot of historians, when I got involved at this site, were very dismissive of Smithwick. And He's he's a hundred years old when he's when he's orating he's 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 delivering his memoirs to his adult daughter and then she would record them and share them. It's basically early Texas, a story that he's part of, and then he becomes a gold rusher in California. So it's got some really wild stories, and he is a a rascally, colorful storyteller. And I think that's one of the reasons people dismiss him because he's just having fun. He's too entertaining yeah, to be authentic. Yeah. But he gets a lot of stuff right. And he certainly gets a lot of the geography of this town right. When he talks about where things were, it all kind of makes sense to what we're seeing. And there's occasion when he drops names that, that we know are here. They're uh -huh. people that we're uh -huh. dealing with. So uh, a couple of my favorites, and you may have some comments on them. He rents a, a mule, I think, or a horse from a stable on the east side of this town run by a family, a Tejano family, who are running a stable here. And he misses the name by one, assuming he got this right. He calls him Jose Real in the book. The gentleman's name, as we understand it, was Jose Leal, but he's pretty darn close in the scheme of things. And because he's this colorful storyteller guy, he talks about riding the horse to Brazoria and riding it back so hard that he kills the horse before he gets back here. And he spends several days trying to avoid the, 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 <laughs> the operator and ultimately has to pay for the horse. He gets taken to the municipal court here, the, yep, the, the yep. town court, and has to pay for the horse. But probably the, the one that most people know, if they know any, is his banishment story. Do you, right. you have yeah. that one you don't want to talk about? Well, that? he was, I, I don't remember the details, but he was banished for being a bad citizen. Right. And, it, and so he was, and I think, as I recall, the direct cause of that was not it seemed to me to be kind of accumulation of things. I think like, that's true. We need to get Smithwick out of town because <laughs> nothing good ever happens when he's around. And he but, sort of was, I don't know, he would have been an interesting guy to know. You always wonder when you read kind of what these people were like in real life. You sure. know, what what because you would have been able to figure out, okay, this is this guy's full of it, or this guy's a huckster, or this guy's sincere, or whatever. We figure that out pretty quick when we meet people, but when you read about them, it's kind of hard to do. Although the picture on the front of that book tells you he's, uh, <laughs> that was when he was 100. That's right. Uh, so actually, the footprint of the story, I think, I think Ken's right. There's certainly accumulation here, because Smithwick is involved in all kinds of mayhem in the short time he's in town. But in the instance that actually got him banished, there was an on-the-lamb murder suspect oh, yeah, who had killed the mayor of, of Gonzales <clears throat> and ended up here. And the citizenry took possession of him. Several things that come up, and I was talking about crime and punishment here, involve the fact that there's no jail. There's no real structure mm -hmm. to dealing with mm -hmm. criminals. So in this case, they capture the guy, they chain him to the front of a building, they're trying to decide what to do with him, and Smithwick, because he knows everybody, comes over and is joshing with him because he knows the guy and they're chatting. And he ends up giving him a file 
giving him a gun, <laughs> telling him to get out of town, right? And so all good plans, all no good deed goes unpunished. The guy frees himself, goes out and camps out on the outskirt of town until he's found again, <laughs> at which point he immediately gives up Smithwick. He gave me the gun. <laughs> he gave me the gun. So that's, that's the instance that they say, okay, we've had enough. Yep, we're going to be done with Smithwick. He's gone. Uh, um, what about, so the Kirkendalls? We get a lot of Kirkendall descendants. Do you mm, know that story? Mm. So um, if any of you have ever heard this, the Kirkendall descendant family perceive, I think rightly so, that their ancestor was the first Texas lawman, uh, mm -hmm. somewhat semi-formal lawman, who was killed by a criminal in custody, and then that criminal ended up being executed for, for mm -hmm. killing this mm -hmm. gentleman. So, Yeah, and they were the early rangers, too, a right. lot of the Kirkendalls. There were two brothers, weren't there, or three yes, that came across two, in 1821 or something like that? And, and I think Abner is the one that uh -huh. we're talking about. Yep. And he actually, it's kind of a sad story, there was a scuffle with this prisoner that they had in custody. And again, there's no jail. I was just wrestling these guys and trying to chain them to something or keep possession of them. And the lawman, the Kirkendall uh, actor, got stabbed in the neck. Some yeah. kind of, something happened. And it didn't kill him immediately, but over the course of a few days or a week, he bled out and died and they couldn't staunch the bleeding. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up hanging the, the criminal. So that was another one of those, kind of like Dylan's call, where I'd get calls from the Kirkendall saying, we want you to show us the jail. Right. Yeah. Ain't no jail. Man, I wish I could. I don't, I don't know where we're going. The first jail in Houston was a pit in the ground <laughs> on the same, on the site of the courthouse where I office. Uh, and there's a great story in one of Hardin's books about, and it's in the court record, you can, I've read it, where uh, the judge said, well, I was going to sentence you to be executed next spring, but the jail is in such wretched condition and there's not enough blankets and you'll get sick, so I'm just going to have you executed next week. <laughs> <laughs> Doing you a favor. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, many of you probably know Professor Hardin's work, uh, Texian Iliad, which is sort of the standard on the Texas Revolution story. The book you're referring to, I think, is Texian Macabre. Texian Macabre, which, which is, is probably actually, my favorite. It's my it, favorite. It book. is mine, too. It's his, too. Yeah. And it's actually a great history of Houston right. in the early days. And my great great grandfather makes an appearance as <laughs> one of the physicians that digs up the heads of these executed guys for phrenology studies. So I'm really, I'm proud. Nice. <laughs> so, thinking about where law and history and museums and people intersect, uh, you're certainly aware, but I'm hoping you have a few comments about probate and deed and civil lawsuit records oh, I, have been yes. a huge trove of information for us. That's one of the ways we can tell you stories of people that lived here and give you some sense of things that were happening here. And they often have a lot more detail in them than any other record we can find from letters or from whatever. Um, those of you that have visited our new outdoor exhibit, uh, the Via de Austin outside with the reconstructed buildings, the material culture there, a lot of that comes straight off of probate records mm -hmm. where we see a business person has passed and when the lawyers sweep in, they're making essentially three lists. Who owed you, who did you owe, and what do you actually possess? Right. And from that, we can start putting together We're still material that culture. Way. Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, um, does that surprise you? Do you use those resources well, as a hobby yeah, researcher? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things that got me more serious, in a, in a more serious about history, was court record preservation in Harris County, because we have one of the first four district courts, and then we had you know, a municipal court like St. Felipe did before independence in Harrisburg, and so we have all those records. And uh, that is the last sort of last frontier of unmined stuff uh, because, you know, researchers are not always as thorough as they probably should be, but I mean, you find it, the way the probate system works, and we adopted the English common law and, and basically drafted our laws after uh, the United States and England in probate, you know, like you said, who, right. who do you owe, who owes you, and what do you have? And you have to list it and you have to swear to it. So people tend to tell the truth in those court records, which because they're scared. That's how we design the system. You go to jail if you make it false, <laughs> in theory. Uh, and so uh, probate especially can give you an idea of, it, and now it's a snapshot in time, but it'll give you an idea of what someone actually had. And then the stories of their lives, especially the more active citizens, are in those court records. One of the interesting things, and here, I've been through Harris County's more than anybody's, more than any other place. Um, uh, you look at the jurors, 
and you see the same names, you know, Andrew Briscoe, Francis Lubbock, um, and just how they did the jury. And then you see stories, the daily lives of William Marsh Rice, or one, one researcher in the 80s found a lawsuit between Marabou Lamar and Sam Houston. To this day, Nobody has written about that. No biographer of either has written about that case. Um, you know, they hated each other. And the day before, the night before the inauguration, Houston threw a big party in what passed for the executive mansion. It was a two room house. And they ran out of firewood. So he started burning the floor, <laughs> boards, and the furniture. And so Lamar sues him and attaches a bunch of his property, which sort of means he sequesters it pending the outcome of the case. So we have a document that lists all this stuff, like, you know, brace of pistols, sword, cane. I mean, all of that stuff that he used at San Jacinto, spurs. Uh, that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Houston ended up winning. But um, just stuff like that that you find. Um, That's a great tangent to something I wanted to talk to you about that happens here. And we knew about this from our research, and we assumed it was one of those nerdy levels that history people go to but most of you as visitors would not appreciate. But we've, we've thrown it out a little bit. And it has to do with Stephen F. Austin being in prison in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And so for us, the key story is helping our visitors understand that the issue that got him in trouble and got him, you know, is it a treason charge? Who knows? They never charge him with anything, but they, right. they hold him. He's a political prisoner. But what he asks for that creates the problem is the political separation of Texas from Coila, creating separate statehood. And when he's told no, he kind of acts like we're gonna do it anyway and that gets him in trouble. But what nobody knows, the delegations that met here in 1832 and 1833 put together a grocery list of concerns. That's the most important one. But some of the other things they ask for um, are similarly interesting. Uh, including the right to practice Protestant faith, which looks like it might have some legs, the ability to use uh, English in filing legal documents, mm -hmm. can we be a bilingual society, that might have some legs. But they also specifically ask for jury trial. That's yeah. one of the things that they're interested in. Because in the Mexican system, where the federal court system is ruled by judges, there's certainly a perception of, of impropriety, of bias, of controversy, of political uh, favoritude, favoritude and that sort of thing. So I get it. Um, we were stunned and we were working with the Historical Society, the Supreme Court Historical Society, when we started exploring this, to have found record of a jury trial involving Celia Allen's case, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which as best we can tell, may be the first in Texas. There, there aren't a lot be. that you can find. Yeah, that that's that for sure. Um, so this is the slave woman I mentioned who was manumitted and ended up in court many times not over the legalities of slavery in Mexico, but over the probate that ultimately freed her and whether it was handled properly or not. So it's interesting to see that play out. We keep a copy of the, the jury, um, the actual uh, decision of the case out in the courthouse out there so people can see it. And it's not particularly exciting. When we talk about what a big story this is, they basically say, they're never gonna get this money, it's not recoverable, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's over. But, uh, and that leads to, to certifying her freedom. But it's interesting how those things work. Were those records in, Bill, yeah, in Belleville? Yeah, yeah. The they, problem with Texas is every courthouse has had a fire. Some are even accidents. Right. And uh, <laughs> I know the Austin County had a big fire. And, you know, golly, that's the records that must have been in there. Brazoria County had a fire. Um, the local Duval claim, County was not an accident. <laughs> the local claim is that most of the colonial records are still intact. And we partner with the county clerk. They're a great uh, research repository for us. I know one of their challenges is that the way that you historically keep some of these records and probate is part of it, mm -hmm. they're not separated necessarily by date. So I can't go ask them, I want to see the Austin Colony probate records. Mm -hmm. That's not how they're filed. I've got to know who died. I've got to know how it might have processed. And so it's always complicated to your point. So it's tough yeah. to jump in there. The other thing about probate that's so important in, te in modern Texas is that is one of the key sources for African-American genealogy right. is probate records because they were assets. Yeah. And so you find, I know in Montgomery County, I've done some work on that. And uh, if you want to find names, that's where you're going to find them. And uh, that's a very, because there were no genealogical records. Right. And a lot of times it's a first name. You're still working. You're right. still connecting, right. but at least you're getting somewhere down the road. Yeah, it's very true. Um, have you heard the story of uh, 
oh, what's his name? The founder of Kerrville, James Kerr. James Kerr. Yeah, who's on the wall over here. Um, when we did our photo exhibit in the temporary gallery, those of you that may have seen that, Faces of Austin's Colony, that was a great exhibit. we had a lot of fun with that exhibit. Um, we learned in putting his story on that wall because he had a great photo. Uh, I tell people who remember it, they'll come in and go, didn't you have a picture of a guy that won an, er an ugly man contest? Yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> and he wasn't even the ugliest guy in that room. So, <laughs> But uh, he did a weird thing at, at a time when the culture related to slavery certainly didn't do this kind of thing. He seems to have recorded his own biracial children that he fathered mm -hmm. through enslaved women. And I know someone in Fort Bend County who is connecting his genealogical dots because of that. So it's a really yeah. powerful moment for them. So um, important. Yeah. They had, uh, they had a case, I was telling our interns today, of a lady named Emmeline, very similar to Celia Allen. She was, she was freed by being taken. She, her children were with someone that had owned her. And he took her to Philadelphia and lived and did whatever you had to do to, to live there, which meant everybody was free. Mm -hmm. And then she comes back to Texas after his death through Tennessee, and a slave catchers capture her. And they're going to take her to Louisiana and sell her and the kids. Well, if that happens, you never, you, you know, you're done. So she gets Peter Gray, who founded a law firm called Gray Botts and Baker. Maybe you've heard of him, <laughs> uh, Baker Botts, and uh, he was a Confederate officer, and et cetera. So this is before the Civil War, but um, very prominent lawyer in Houston who represented her, and I would imagine for free. She files a lawsuit in district court in Harris County and has a jury trial, including Francis Lubbock was on that jury, and the jury finds that she was free, um, and they made that case. Uh, into an operetta and performed say, it in my courthouse. It, yeah. The first time in the world history that uh, legal pleadings were sung as part of an opera. But <laughs> <laughs> they sung the interrogatory responses, David. So uh, who, kn who knew they could read? We're ready for some legal theater when you and your friends. That's right. <laughs> but those stories are just, you know, and without court records, you're never going to know. Right. You know? So one of our other favorite kind of legal history stories I wanted to get your perspective on has to do with the war government here. Because if anything, the reveal for our story, for visitors who are excited that there's a Stephen F. Austin uh, historic site in the current landscape, we're thrilled to be able to bring this up kind of late in the game. But they really don't understand some of the political machinations on the road to independence, right? And if you just look at the calendar, it's a short independence cycle, the six months of fighting. But most of those months are before a declaration of independence, mm -hmm. right? So the things are, are kind of weirdly staged. And what I want to ask you about is what you think from a legal perspective the war government here is trying to accomplish. Do they have a good basis for their claims? You know, I joke with school kids when we go through our scenario in the back and we do a little immersive where you get to be a delegate. I hope some of you have had a chance to do that before. And one of the scenarios is we're going to vote on whether we're fighting for independence or not. The war government here in 1835. Well, of course, as we knew when we wrote the exhibit, you all say, heck yeah, we're fighting for independence. But the history and the reason we asked that question is because the government here said, no, that's not what we're fighting for. So they're advocating what amounts to regime change. We're going to topple Santa Ana. They're advocating for civil war. And there are a lot of reasons for it. But do you see any any interest in the legal oh, side? Gosh, of what we could be here do? all night talking about it. <laughs> One thing that has become apparent to me on this kind of issue, when you start to talk about the politics, because the war is the sexy part. Right. That's the part that you're going to make movies about. But really, it's it's more interesting and in some cases more violent the politics of it all. Um, because think about who uh, came to Texas, the type of person that would leave civilization. And this was not civilization. I mean, this was a wild land. Right. I mean, I don't like it when the air conditioner is set right. Can you imagine being out here trying to live in this stuff? That's a type of person that, that is willing to do that. And they were, a lot of them were educated, a lot of them were lawyers, and they were very strident in what they wanted. But they kind of had the freedom to fight each other because they were under the Mexican government putatively. But there weren't any there wasn't any enforcement to speak of of right. Mexican law. And so they were free to kind of act like they were going to form a country. And so everybody's opinion became equal, which is never the case. Uh, 
And, it, and if you want to know what that's like, just get on Twitter. Because <laughs> everyone thinks their opinion is valid and matters, when in fact none of it does. And, uh, and so they were all just very strident in what they thought was right. And so you had these factions. And within the group that the war party, like you correctly referred to them, everybody on the Brazos wanted to fight Mexico. They just weren't agreeing on what they wanted to fight for or about. And they were mad about different things. And so that creates a very chaotic situation. And should we have statehood? And should we have independence? And um, so they're fighting each other, really, yeah. more than Mexico at that point. And, um, you know, there was one, one of my favorite little ditties is Henry Smith was the governor, uh, or was the, I guess they call him the governor, yeah. uh, during the consultation in early 36. And, and they got so mad at him, they impeached him. And then he refused to leave office and continued to act as governor. And so you had, and, and this Robinson is during the time where they're giving orders to Sam Houston and giving orders to the people at the Alamo and giving, you know, and, and James uh, Robinson. Robinson, you know, I mean, it's just a mess. And then who took all the stuff from the Alamo and went to Matamoros, so, also a James, decides, you know what, I'm just gonna go to attack Mexico. Who's with me? And he gets a group with, with a him. Couple of campaigns. Takes the food and takes the weapons and takes everything out of the Alamo that so, he could carry. Um, and anyway, it's just a total disaster. So James Robinson was the lieutenant governor in this story right, right, at right. the time of the impeachment, right. which is why he was invoked. And I always tell people the simple answer for me, the Cliff Notes version of the war government, is that you had a governor who was decidedly war party. You had a, a Congress, a legislative body that was appointed who were decidedly against separation they, they were to ken's point they're all for fighting for something right but they're not sure what it is and so i always tell people when they ask questions about them this is a government that couldn't sit at a table and order turkey sandwiches together yeah. and they're trying to run a war and so one of their strategies is to attack matamoras that's yeah. that's an actual they proclaim that's their strategy we're going to take the war to them and then you end up with two disastrous efforts to do the to do that, which would never have succeeded. We've got some friends here who are connected to the Texas Navy story, and Ken's certainly involved with that group as well. I've been excited in recent years. This war government story, that's part of the audacity of what's happening here in that time. The first four ships bought that become part of the Republic of Texas Navy are bought by this government. Um, we were learning and doing some research, and uh, Dahlum certainly helped us, if you all know Dahlum Masterson out there, um, in recognizing that when those ships are in the Gulf while the battles are taking place and leading up to the mm -hmm. incident in the pocket that you mentioned, the only orders they've ever been given are by the government here because nobody can communicate with them when we move and declare independence. So right. they don't know things have changed. They just know they're patrolling the Gulf yeah. and trying to see what's happening with the Mexican Navy. So very exciting stuff. It's All right. Crazy. This is what I'm. Well, I'm going to let you. So anything you want to end on a topic you want to talk about tonight that I haven't touched well, on? Well, I'm not up for elections, so All we right. won't talk about that. <laughs> uh, I don't know what I want to talk about. I, uh, well, I'm going to leave. It I will say I'll preach know. a little bit for a minute. Um, history is, you know, we're in a difficult time for history just in general. Doesn't matter what topic, and so I appreciate y'all's dedication to it because there's a lot of dishonesty out there and uh, in the study of history now, and it's really pretty sad. So uh, keep up the good work and uh, just do just do your little part, do your family, do whatever, but um, but do it. It's so important. And this, this is such, thanks for having me because this place is one of my favorite <laughs> historic sites in Texas because you're standing where it happened. And you can walk out, I love, I can just stand for hours in the fall uh, by that, <laughs> by that map. And I, he's watched me do it, you know, I'll just stare off into space and I'm looking at the map and I stare off into space. Yeah. You know, my daughter's wandering around in the woods, but uh, <laughs> dad's at the map again. It's such a special, special place and they've done a wonderful job here and are going to continue to build point, it. You know, our agency branded itself after transfer of these historic sites 15 years ago as real places telling real stories. So I get visitors, particularly those that aren't from either Southeast Texas or from Texas at all, will sometimes say, wow, this is a really impressive thing. Why did you build it here? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is where it happened. This is, this not is, sure this how to answer that one. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not. Now, now, Curtis Brenner, who's with us, alleges that if the water gets low enough, we can see the ferry. 
Uh, I've heard that, that right? story, but, but I've never seen it, Curtis, so you'll have to bring me out on that day. <laughs> All right. So one of my first years here to that point, we were in a drought in 2008. And I was, oh, in the, yeah. I was in the old barn across the street, the original Josie store building. And I saw several TxDOT vehicles pull up and stop right by the bridge. And then I saw them get out and walk up the bridge. So I came out to see what the heck was going on, of course, because what do you pay a state employee to do on their property? <laughs> yeah. So I walked out and found them looking over. They were looking for the ferry. And they said, oh, I mean, when it's low, this is the time you can see it. And we didn't see it that day. So that it. was my only shot, and it didn't happen. <laughs> um, so this is where I turn it over to you, and we'll come out and help facilitate questions. Anything any of you want to ask while we have the privilege of John, Judge Wiseman's day? Tell us a little bit about William and Mary of Orange, their tax assessor. William and Mary. Of Orange, and, and their tax assessor who became the Banner Out de Bastrop. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I hadn't prepared for that. Baron de Bastrop was an interesting guy. How would you describe him? He was kind of a... You, you want to say he was a hustler, but he but he was doing good stuff. I mean, he wanted to be involved. He wanted. I sense. And even his he, origin story, there's been some pivot on mm -hmm. some legitimacy that he may not have fully abandoned the family. There's there's. Yeah, the story, story is uh, that he that he came to the United States, leaving his family, created this new identity. There's actually a lot of that in old Texas, right? Uh, because what are I mean? How are you ever going to get caught? But he affected this royal air and dressed like he was some kind of exotic. Uh, prince or whatever, and by the you know, but he was really good with the government, and uh, without him, I don't think Austin would have sealed the deal. I, I think that's and, obviously uh, true. He's connected to both Moses and Stephen, so he right. he has this chance encounter with Moses Austin that brokers yeah. the deal in San Antonio for the for the immigration effort, and then he becomes the first land commissioner for Stephen here. So one of the resources that we have in the exhibit, which is. Uh, a generously, the GLO, the General Land Office, allowed us to digitize a copy of what's called the register, the registro, which is the administrative copies of all these old 300 land grants. And for people that come in with that genealogy, who are privileged to have that story, who still have their deed at home, it's in the safe deposit box mm -hmm. or whatever, they'll sometimes come in and get offended when they see my version because the Baron de Bastrop's not on it. He's already died by the time they're catching up the administrative copy. So he signed their copy, but he didn't sign mine, <laughs> as fate would have it. But yeah, really fascinating story. He's going to have a prominent role in this temporary installation we're working on because of his role as land commissioner. And I'll be frank, we're struggling a little bit with what part of the bio do we tell. This is, a, this is a, an exhibit talking about a lot of things, so we don't have to go real deep. But we certainly know Talk people about are fascinated. He was the tax assessor and collector of William and Mary of Orange. That would be yeah, an interesting point of connection, no doubt. Anybody else have some questions we can feel? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Beth Fisher. Hi. We're both descendants of Samuel Rose Fisher, the first secretary of the Oh, yeah. And we're doing, I just can't find an answer to this question. There was, there had to be some kind of overland trail between Mighty Board and here. There's just too many meetings here. And the people in Mighty, when Glasgow probably came out of the brasses on a steamboat, but how did they get here from Mighty Board? Do you know? Well, the, the roads, I mean, there weren't any roads to speak of. I mean, a, a trail would be someone telling you how to get here would become a trail and there were probably multiple ways to do that um, but there weren't marked lines on a map where you would go you would just go however you could and, and if you think about it especially coming from that area you know how many little streams and gullies and etc you'd have to cross so you might go this way one day but if the water's up you might go that way and so the, you're not going to find the road um, when you talk about it. the only the only the roads you're going to see are the King's Highways, right? And the, the, the Lava road, road. The, the roads that show up on the map in our lobby are the things that were prominent enough that they're yeah. semi-permanent. But to Ken's point, everything else is somewhat volatile. I agree with you, uh, Beth, that. There's clearly a general swath, a general trail, mm -hmm. and so many people are coming up from the coast. I know we've got. Uh, Stephen Fly here tonight, who's got ancestry in the, the, the uh, Alabama settlements down near Edna, uh, Jackson County today, and they're all certainly connected. But I'd also say to Ken's point, it's mostly over land. Steamboats aren't getting up here this far till really late. So everybody's moving on two or four legs 
for the most part and just well, kind of navigate. Well, I started moving around too to, to get the information from here and then when you started the printing press, somehow they got it down there. Right, right. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what about Caney Creek? Um, I don't know if you're aware of that, that's in Matagorda County. Right. And from my understanding, it was much wider than it is today. Are you familiar? Uh, with no, that? but every county has a Caney Creek. So. Yeah. <laughs> it is the most popular name. Is that uh, right? Oh, it's got to be. It's right. right on the Brazoria County, Don Conrad, County line. Conrad, he's got Caney Creek right near. Yeah, there's Caney Creek all over Grimes County. Well, could that have been a vehicle for them to navigate from here to there? Because it's pretty wide. It used to be. Yeah. Uh, Granite down to down the creek and soldiers and yeah I don't you know water they wouldn't be able to get here in a water traffic is not how yeah. people are coming this far it may be part of their journey but it's rarely all of their journey so of yeah Gary did you have a question back there yes you guys are talking about nine lawyers and nobody's mentioned Samuel Williams can you enlighten us a little bit about Samuel Williams please. How much of a story do you was want to know? Was he a lawyer? He wasn't a lawyer, was he? <laughs> he was not. No, yeah. Samuel May Williams. So we always tell people, you know, Sam Williams is the secretary of Austin's colony. Interestingly, he's one of the people that comes to Texas under an alias. I mean, mm -hmm. Ken mentioned how that was a common happening, and yeah, he's one of them. But uh, we always think about Williams as being the true entrepreneurial visionary of Austin's colony. He had a better a better vision of the business angle. He, he could work the money side of it. What's got value? What's, what's going to have some play? Where Stephen F. Austin seemed to have this philosophical altruism about mm -hmm. nation building and culture, he would have wasted every dollar in his pocket, whether it got him to the finish line or not. And in often many cases did. Yeah. Where Williams and his partner, um, Thomas McKinney, they really figured out some of the money angle and in ways that got them in trouble. They certainly were controversial figures as the war came up. Uh, he and Austin had a falling out when Austin was imprisoned in Mexico City because of these conceptualized potential land swindles. And it's still not 100% clear what the motivations were for some of the guys who were involved in taking land grants. But what it looked like to many of the settlers is that the guys who were connected to the impresarios went out and swept up a bunch of land that they were going to sell and make money off of. And they were referred to as the speculators. That's right. Derisively, the speculators. He's a speculator. And in this particular instance, when Austin was imprisoned, Sam Williams had asked the Coelan government for a huge allotment of land to help put down revolutionaries. And ultimately, a lot of those revolutionaries ended up with big swaths of land. So it was a little, <laughs> little challenge. But he's the, uh, it's his elegant handwriting that you see throughout our exhibit. Um, the reason he was so valuable to Austin's colony, his family was part of a shipping magnet in Baltimore. And he had been sent for the family business to learn about the burgeoning markets in Latin America. So he had spent time in Venezuela. He had learned Spanish. He was very fluent. Uh, and when he comes to Austin's colony, he's, he's practically invaluable. There's no one who has the skill set that he has. And he sort of accidentally shows up here and becomes a key part of Austin's operation. Well, and his name is in record after record and story after right. story for right. a long time, including yeah. he was a naval commissioner uh, and just, I mean, all kinds of crazy things. Built the first, I think McKinney and Williams built the first warehouse of any kind in Houston. They also had right. the warehouse on Galveston Island, yeah. which has now become the source of some of the Texas Navy objects that we're exploring mm. for exhibit support, which is really a cool story. And of course, a lot of the guys, during the Republic, when Galveston really flourishes on the front end, people like uh, Gail Borden, people like Sammy Mae Williams are part of that story. And if I'm not mistaken, the Williams house may still be the, the oldest yeah. still standing mm. home on Galveston Island. So uh, certainly a wonderful They own the island when oh, yeah. the Allen brothers tried to buy their part of it right. for the town of Houston and failed. So really fascinating stuff. And, you know, just on a purely superficial level, Gary, I would tell you visitors who register Samuel Bay Williams when they come to our exhibit, they talk about his signature, which is visible in a handful of places. But specifically, they talk about his paraffe, if you all know what that is. So from the Spanish culture, that's where you have the swirly, designy stuff underneath your signature. And so I need to work on it. Yeah, you should have a nice one. He, uh, his is really elegant, and you can kind of see the sweeps he's doing with the pen. It's incredibly consistent. But he creates these three diamond-shaped pockets under his name 
that he then comes back and puts a dot in each one. <laughs> it's really compelling. And the, the exhibit's open after we're done here. Go take a look. <laughs> Anybody, yes, go ahead, Steve. You talk about the consultations of uh, 32 and 33. Is there very much evidence of, of after, after that was put together, the, the, the response from the government in Monclova or, 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 or Mexico? Well, we know after the 80, after the 32 convention, sorry, the, the 32 and 33 conventions happen only six months apart. And they essentially come to the same grocery list conclusion of things we're not happy about. After the 32 convention, they get word, I believe from San Antonio, but maybe from interior Mexico that says, yeah, you don't get to do that. that that's not one of your rights as a citizen to get together and gripe no. about us. So don't do that again. So six months later, they do it again. And one of the things about the 32 convention that seems pretty evident, they did a nice job of coming up with what they weren't happy about. But at the end of the meeting, they don't know what to do with it. Right. Well, what, what now? Yeah. <laughs> we made the list. What do you want? So right. the next year, and there's a lot of interesting politics to this. So Stephen F. Austin, if you don't know the story, is opposed politically to the 32 convention, which has been called for his town. He doesn't think it's politically prudent. He thinks it's aggressive beyond appropriateness but once the commitment is made he he allows himself to become the chair he's put forth as the chairman of the convention and he runs it in 33 Austin opponents shut him down when they come back and they use some parliamentary maneuvers to make sure he doesn't become chair again and yet when they come up with their list and they decide this time somebody's got to take this to Mexico City Austin's one of the only guys willing to do it. So uh, there are three appointees who are told to take stuff, to take the list down. And as I joke with visitors here, the other two had to walk their dog or wash their hair the day they were leaving. So <laughs> Austin ended up on his own. So yeah. he ends up taking this list down. Austin was in a very difficult position because he was, he was accountable to the Mexican government and had made a deal with them. Right. You know, and he felt compelled to honor that to the extent and then he just lost control of the crazies that yeah. he brought over here so <laughs> and, and that's that's great in a nutshell what's exactly right about that perception of austin is that he believed both legally and i think morally he was a true believer in the idea that he had signed on to be part of building a nation yeah. and it takes him longer than almost everyone else to figure out that's just not going to work so right. he is a champion ultimately for independence he is certainly a champion you know when he comes back have you seen the new exhibit at the Alamo, the new exhibit mm -hmm, hall? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't had a chance to go see, if you want to hear Ernesto talk about it next month, come Definitely see Definitely hear him, Ernesto. Yeah. He's yeah. awesome. So um, the new exhibit hall that they've designed, which is really a curatorial facility that's a stand-in until they build the bigger buildings. Um, I was privileged to see it earlier this year, and I was joking with Ernesto and his staff after the fact they have a, a fabulous document room. And I don't know if you guys are nerdy about documents. There's regular exhibits, there's pretty objects, there's pretty pictures, but the document room is really where some of the it's crazy stories are. Shocking. And on the wall, it struck home with me immediately. I had a fight with our exhibit team six and seven years ago. There's a letter that Austin writes in his hand that becomes a popular broadside as soon as he gets back from prison in Mexico City. And the quote that comes out of it is generally listed as war is our only resource. The phrase, I think most of you would know, should be recourse. War is our recourse, yeah. right? But the handwriting is questionable. The S's and the C's throughout that document are hard to discern. And I made the argument we should go with what he meant, which I think the handwriting even supports. And I got shut down. I got outvoted by everybody else on our exhibit team. <laughs> that's not the way this story gets told. Even if he wrote the wrong thing, that's just you, man. That's how, that's how people are. Well, if you go to the Alamo document room in the new collection facility, they have up on the wall in big letters, war is our only recourse. <laughs> they have landed that plane. Finally, we so, won at the Alamo. Good on them. That's right. <laughs> so, and I had to lose even though I was on their team. So got to love that. Um, Anyway, I do want to give you a chance to say anything else you'd like before we break tonight. I appreciate you, uh, Thank you all for coming. coming out tonight. Yeah, we really enjoy filling this room. Um, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I've talked to people about being a new historic site and how difficult it was to predict how many people are going to care, how many people are going to come. You know, We made the mistake of looking at the visitation at the known revolution sites that have a 60 to 75 year head start on what we're doing just as a physical presence, forgetting about the stories. And quite frankly, the story of this town 
was lost. You're experiencing it in almost real time. Um, those of you that have read Austin's biography by Greg Cantrell, which is certainly still the standard on him, Greg's been very generous with what we've done here and often says it's time for somebody else. So if you're looking for a biography to write, Greg says it's time for, for a new biographer to come to Austin. But he was telling us early on he couldn't find anything about the town. Those records weren't there. Mm -hmm. As an academic historian, he didn't have time or energy. There was so much about Austin that was known. He didn't have time to get into all those probate records mm -hmm. and figure out what was happening here. So this is a, a new story. We're privileged to tell it. We're not seeing visitors the same way that San Jacinto and Washington the Brazos and the Alamo see visitors. But what's going to happen, I think, is that as more people like you come out and support what we do and, and share what you appreciate about us with your <coughs> friends and family, we'll grow. And I think the most important part of us opening this facility five years ago is that we got ahead of imagining a new Alamo and Washington the Brazos and San Jacinto and all those sites are going to have to incorporate us in their story in some way. And so the future that I imagine is a visitor who's excited about going back to see a new Washington on the Brazos, seeing some reference to what happened here and going, I don't know that place. I haven't been to that place. And that's what's gonna motivate them to get in a car and come down here. So um, as I tell my stakeholders in Austin when they ask why the visitors aren't coming in, in droves, we put lipstick on a, what used to be a pig that people still don't know is a pig. So there's a lot of moving parts. We gotta figure that out. All right, thank you all for coming out tonight. If you wanna to talk to me about the painting, come on up. If you wanna to talk to Ken, I'm sure he'll be here for a few minutes. I'll be here. The exhibit hall is open. The gift shop is open. Uh, our 30% sale is a, is a summer promotion. So you, can, you don't have to buy tonight. But if you're Christmas shopping, you gotta buy by August. So don't wait too late. And, uh, We'll see where it all goes. Thank you all for coming. Hope Thank you, you all. all.